Hi guys. In the previous episode, we talked about the Matebele War between the Ndebele and the British South Africa Company. This episode picks up the timeline from where we left off, after the war in 1894. In this episode, we are going to introduce two key players in our timeline. The first one, the Ndebele Queen Lozike. And I'm pretty much sure this is the first time a lot of people have heard of this name. And why is this so? She was a powerful senior queen who took leadership after the disappearance of Lobengula and rallied the Ndebele warriors into the first Chimringa war. The second key role player I'm going to talk about is Mukwati. He was the visionary and strategist behind the first Chimringa war. He is the mastermind behind the first secret alliance between the Shona people and the Ndebele people. He was known to have given the British settlers a torrid time. Just an interesting fact here, the Mukwati building, a massive 21-story building located in Harare, is named after him and serves as present-day government offices in Harare, Zimbabwe. Just something to quickly note before we dive into our timeline. As discussed in a previous episode, Zimbabwe was actually known as Rhodesia at this point in time. Even the city names were different back then. They had all been named by the British South Africa Company. The country and city names were only changed when Zimbabwe received its independence in 1980. In my videos, I am going to refer to the country as Zimbabwe before independence. Unbeknown to the British South Africa Company, after the disappearance of Lobengula, his wife, Senior Queen Lozike, secretly and strategically stepped up assumed command of what was left of the army and became the queen regent of the Ndebele people in a time of crisis. The queen is part of a collection of strong, influential and remarkable royal African women in our history. She was known to be firm, confident and assertive. She was described as a dangerous and intriguing woman in her biography by Clark and Nyati in 2013. Her role in the country's resistance has been ignored and marginalized by mainstream history. Queen Lozike was a key player behind the scenes. She led the Ndebele people with such discretion that even the oppressive forces themselves did not understand her role. After Lobengula, the British South Africa Company had stopped the Ndebele people from appointing a successor to ensure that the Ndebele warriors would never get another chance to come together and rally another powerful army. Therefore, Queen Lozake had to conceal herself and her position from the European settlers. Even European writers were not aware of her power and influence behind the scenes. Queen Lozake was married to Lobengula to strengthen his military base, as her family, the Dlodlo, were military experts. As soon as she got married to Lobengula, she assumed the position of a military strategist and a highly respected senior queen for the people. From the day she took up this role, she never stopped fighting for her people. After the land and livestock dispossession of the Ndebele people in 1894 in the Matebele War, Queen Lozike was resolute in her vision for a reinstated Ndebele kingdom and return of her people's land and livestock. Despite their previous tough laws, <coughs> She took the initiative of rallying the Ndebele for yet another war against the British South Africa Company. She instructed her twin brother, Muntuani Dlodlo, to begin rebuilding the Ndebele's military unit. The queen carefully stored some of the ammunition which had not been used by Lobengula in the Matebele War in preparation for the next uprising. The Ndebele people's fighting spirit was boosted when they heard that the British South Africa Company, led by Jemison, remember Jemison was placed in charge of Rhodesia by the British South Africa Company, and he had been defeated by the Boers in the 1895 Jemison raid in the Cape Colony, South Africa. This showed the Ndebele people that the white man was not invincible. They too could go to war and win Provided their past experiences with fighting the British South Africa Company, the Debele knew that this time around they needed a different strategy. You cannot repeat the same thing over and over again expecting different results. The only way they could successfully dethrone the British South Africa Company was if they collaborated with the Shona people. March 1896. After the Matebele War, 
the country faced a serious drought which halted most of the farming activities and saw the death of massive cattle herds, thus leading to a period of famine for the Zimbabwean people. This only added fuel to the fire, as most of the population had been relocated to non fatal land under the British regime. The British South Africa Company had taken most of the people's livestock, so they did not have much to live on. The Shona traditional religion played a prominent role in the lifestyle and identity of the people. A great strategist and spirit medium, Mukwati, used his influence and position as the leader in the Mwari religion to send the message that God, Mwari, had told him that indeed the cause of all their problems, including the drought, was because of the white men. Therefore, the British settlers had to be driven out of the country. God would be with them as they did so. Mukwati shared his vision, and his vision was to create an alliance with the Ndebele and the Shona in order to dethrone the British South African Company. When he approached the Ndebele people with this strategy, they immediately jumped on board as they had already been secretly training for a war to avenge the death of their people and to take back their land from the British South Africa Company. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Shona's resentment of the colonial settlers grew exponentially by the day. From 1894 onwards, Resistance was more visible amongst the Shona people with isolated incidents of rebellion. There was localized resistance on individual Europeans and the British South Africa Company would immediately crush these small uprisings and threaten anyone who attempted to rebel against them. Remember, the Shona people's lifestyle revolved around farming and trading. They did not know much about war strategies as the Ndebele, so they could only do as much. April 1896, the planning for the uprising was set in motion. The Ndebele set up the Mukwati headquarters in Matebeleland, which was going to be the central meeting place for the uprising in Matebeleland. Mukwati made his first step to discreetly begin communications with the Shona under the British radar. The Shona leaders welcomed this conversation with open arms. They too were ready to set their differences aside with the Ndebele and fight their common oppressor together, fight for their land, and fight for their freedom. In the next episode, we are going to explore these secret meetings and gatherings which took place between the Shona and the Debele, and their strategy for the first Chimringa War in great detail, highlighting more key players such as Mbuyani Handa Nyakasikana, Sekuru Kagui, Chief Bonda, and Chief Mashia Mombe. So stay tuned for the next episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Thank you for watching.